Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another show of Loving the Game. And as most of you probably know, tonight's guest um, is a uh, Springbok legend in most, in many ways, um, a rugby commentator, a coffee, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Connoisseur is probably a good word, um, and so many other things. But let me not waste any more time. Let me introduce you to none other than Kobus Visa. Kobus, thank you so much for joining me tonight. It's such an honor to have you. Thanks, Jaki. Anytime. It's a great pleasure. Kobus, um, I'm not going to waste a lot of time. Um, please tell me, um, uh, just off the cuff, I mean, everybody knows a lot about you and some people might not know exactly what you're up to these days. So if you can just give us a quick introduction as to what you're up to these days, because I'm sure everybody knows who you were back in the day. Jack, I don't know if you can hear me, but I've lost sound, unfortunately. We're just going to try and get back. So we'll just quickly get Kubus. Kids, thanks very much for helping us out with some technical stuff here. Um, one of those Sorry, things man. that happen. No problem. When you're ready, just let us know. Okay, Kubus has just left us for a for a quick second there. Just to give a bit of a background, I mean, Kubus was in, we'll obviously touch on it as we go, but Kubus um, matriculated and went to school at Paul Gym. Um, and then obviously had a, a stellar career with the Lions of the 90s, um, the, probably the best team they ever had. And um, yeah, so, I mean, he's joined us again. Let's see if we back in action again. Kubus, can that. you hear us? Yes, I can. Sorry about that. I don't know what went wrong. Uh, maybe the sound went into lockdown as well. <laughs> That's fine. Um, as I was saying, please, if you can just maybe tell the people um, what you're up to these days, because, I mean, we're all very much aware of um, who you were back in the day um, when you used to play for the Springboks and Transvaal, as they were known then. Well, uh First, you know, involved at Supersport, obviously, as a, as a, as a great hobby with you. As you know, uh, we work together and uh, uh, I love it. it it's, uh, I'm not involved in coaching uh, for personal reasons. Um, and uh, um, that's why I enjoy the television medium immensely. I enjoy the commentary. I try and put back into the game via that uh, with a bit of humor. Uh, and I love, uh, I love what I do there. Then, uh, you know, Belinda and myself, we're in the coffee trade. Uh, um, as you know, we have the regional coffee shops, the Cafe Dolce's, and uh, started a new brand now called Red Berry. Also, our own coffee roastery. We import the green beans, then we roast and blend our own unique range of coffee blends for all our brands, and then all, also other customers. Um, uh, yeah, it keeps me busy at uh, this stage, and, and I enjoy it. I'm very blessed. Kubus, um obviously your love for rugby um, started somewhere along the line in your in your life and um if you can tell us a little bit how or where or who planted that little seed in you for the love of the game can you hear me jockey yes Jock. sorry man i can't hear you guys again apologize for this We'll be back now. Just get Kubus on the oh, line again. Back. Sorry, 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 sorry. There we go. Apologies. Right. Now, okay. So what I was asking is who, who or what planted that little seed for the love of rugby in you and when did it start? Interesting. I I think like like every every boy and girl, young boy and girl out there, we're a nation that love our sport, any sport in general. Um I'm, I'm a huge advocate for sport, especially for young people out there, because uh, a sport actually, in all its forms, is much more important than the game itself. Uh, and, and let me explain. It teaches people valuable life lessons. It, it teaches youngsters that, you know, nothing comes about without honest hard work, uh, commitment, dedication. Um, uh, nothing comes for free, and you must be willing to work hard. But the other side of the coin is also, you're not the only one with these kind of dreams. So a lot of people want to want to do well in what they do. Want to, a lot of people pursue their dreams. 
uh, and and uh, and um, I think uh, unfortunately uh, the difference then comes or fortunately those who get to the top are the ones that sometimes get a bit of lucky break or two, but also are the willing willing to work the hardest, uh, get up earlier, train late, uh, run an extra round, kick an extra few balls, hit a few balls through uh, a few more balls through the hoops and so forth, whatever sport you participate in. But those who are willing to sacrifice, because that's what it takes, is sacrifice. Mm. And sport teaches you that. That's what life's about. That's what business is about, is sacrifice. Those who are willing to sacrifice more, to go further, to try harder. Um, those who are willing to chase their dreams. Um, sometimes people don't believe in those dreams, uh, but yourself, and they call you a fool and, and, and so forth, and a dreamer, but then you have to pursue that. I mean, exactly what you're doing with what we're doing right now. This is a dream I know you've had for a long time, and you pursued it, and well done. Um, it doesn't happen by itself, but that's sport. The value of sport, I think, besides uh, an, a, a nice part is that you are successful in sport. No sportsman that got to the top were always, always, or women were always successful. There are ups and downs. Mm. That's the same as in life, as in business. Uh, and that's why I say sport is so valuable. So I, I chose uh, rugby in the end. I played cricket. I played a bit of, a bit of soccer at primary school, um, a bit of athletics. But I think the, the rugby bug, the team sport environment, uh, appealed to me to me more. Um, and, and, and the reason why is, I mean, my twin brother uh, and good friend, Bruce Fordyce, uh, one of the, the, the biggest <laughs> marathon runners of, of, of all time, you know, Brucey always... Uh, used to say to me, and, and to this day, that you know, I'm very lucky that uh, he didn't play rugby. I would never have made it to the top. So, but I mean, that's just tongue in cheek. Uh, a guy like Bruce, you know, uh, uh, the beauty about sports, uh, if I can can elaborate, is is uh, it, it all shapes and sizes from all walks of life. Uh, when it comes between the four white lines in the sports field, we are all equal, everybody. Then it goes down to yes, talent plays a massive role, and some of us get born with more and or less talent. But talent alone is not enough. Talent yes. alone is not enough. It's about the commitment, the hard work, the passion, uh, and what you put into it. What you put in is what you get up. And that's, again, what rugby taught me. I love a team environment. I think it's sometimes more difficult than individual sports because you rely on people around you. It's sometimes you or those people drop each other and to the detriment of the team. So it's not who is important, the, the individual in the team, but the team in the end that uh, pulls, uh, uh, pulls through and are successful or not. So you, you mentioned the word team quite a lot. And that brings me to my next question is like, um, I know you, you love school rugby a lot. And obviously um, you went to, um, if I'm not mistaken, you went to Paul, Gymna Paul Gymnasium. Um, that's where you went to school. And then from there, well, I don't know where you went exactly, but most of us know that Transvaal became the team that you played for most of your career. And then ultimately you went on to play for the Springboks. In your, in your, as a supporter, who is your favorite team? I mean, you do have a favorite team. We all know you're a commentator. So, you know, it doesn't necessarily, you know, it's, it's a commentator's thing that you can't be sitting there going, yeah, 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 whatever. But I mean, we all know you played for Transvaal a long time, but who do you truly support? Well, Jockey, I mean, uh, I must say this, that my second team is your best team, that is the Blue Bulls. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I'm, obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm a Vol supporter. I'm loyal to the Vol. They've been great to me. I've made some great friends. I've had some wonderful, incredible times with, with, with the Lions. Uh, and, and, and again, they are, uh, what they've offered me, team-wise, team player-wise, coaches-wise, president-wise, union-wise, I could never repay. So I will always be loyal to them. And that's what loyalty is about. It's my duty to be loyal to them uh, to this day. Um, but also, I support any South African side playing against any overseas side. Players. And obviously, the box. I mean, I will, I will go down uh, uh, to my last breath as, as a box supporter. I'm loyal to them because it, it's one of the greatest honors uh, that you can ever uh, get involved in, that you can ever be privileged uh, to be part of, uh, because mm. it's a privilege. Sometimes people think it's a right. It's not a right. It's a privilege to play for your province, for your club to play for your country, uh, because uh, the responsibility that, and accountability that goes with that is immense. But if you do that, if you do thank God it well enough, uh, with the help of your teammates and good coaches and, and, and physios and doctors and all those people, because all that whole team plays a massive part, and the supporters, the supporters play a huge role. Uh, without supporters, there is no game. That's very mm. simple. People should never forget that. 
Um, but there can only be 15 at a time in the, in the case of rugby on each side of the field or 11 in cricket, uh, in soccer and so forth. I mean, it, it, it's, it's one of those beauties of, of, of sport is that, uh, and, and, uh, that you realize that once you run on the field that the accountability and the responsibility you have is not only for yourself to be a self-achiever for the team, but all those like sitting in the stand, the millions at home, I mean, they, they are playing with you. They carry their, uh, their responsibility with you. They, they, they put on yeah. their jersey and, and they have even greater expectations. So you've got to pull your weight. And tell me, um, I mean, you obviously being, you went to school um, in the Cape. Were you born there? Um, how did you end up going to Transvaal? Look, uh, I was born in Palm. My folks are both grew up on farms here in the Borland area, and and, uh, and and I was born in Palm. But we moved to Namibia, uh, the name of Namib Desert. And uh, my first rugby, <laughs> my first rugby introduction was on the salt pans of a town called Luderitz. Now you can go Google this. It's a beautiful old German town on the coast. Coast. There's no water. I mean, there's no grass. Uh, so yeah. so we we physically played on a salt pan. Where they uh, where they drew uh, lines and that's how we played. So the, the big up of that is my mum didn't have to buy a material crumb for the grass beds because that salt uh, you know did the job. So uh, that's why I loved the green grass field of Ellis Park so much because I've never seen such beautiful grass in my entire life when I grew up. Uh, <laughs> but even even then you know lying lying uh, early morning my dad used to wake my brother myself. I mean we used to listen on the radio to the legendary Gerard uh, Bobier doing commentary on the the box playing the All Blacks in New Zealand. And, and great names like uh, Jan Ellis and Fritz de Pree and Moniki Zeru and Paul Bayful. Uh, and so we can carry on. And the likes of the All Blacks of Brian Williams, Sid going Grant Batty, uh, Brian Lahore, just to name a few. I mean, so, yeah. so and, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I, while lying there at three o'clock in the morning while you listen to this game on the radio, um, you think to yourself, geez, this is incredible. You know, 15 men against 15 men trying to outsmart each other, uh, a fanatical crowd. Um, you know, trying to tell them how to do it and millions around the world in mud and rain and snow and wind. And, and in the end, there's so much emotions, you know, there's, there's always a, 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 a part of emotions. You know, at the end of the 80 minutes, you know, half the crowd uh, is the mooring that the ref was bad and the other half is happy uh, and their team have won. So all these emotions, that's what sport brings out. And that really got to me, got me and, I, and it hooked me. And I, and I love the game, the, the physical side of rugby, the skill side of rugby. And the most important thing is, you know, that you can see the world and you can meet friends from all walks of life, all over the world, even your opponents. To this day, some of my best friends were my and are my opponents, people that I played against, because they always say, and, and we as players believe that you, you can get cups and you can get accolades and, and, and awards, but the biggest, the biggest and most honest award you can get is from your opponents, how they rate you. That's something I've picked up from, you know, watching a lot of interviews um, over the years. How many players always come back to that one point, the friends that they made um, on the field and mostly opponents that they played against. Um, you mentioned two things there that brings me, you know, to my next um, qu two questions and I'll throw them in at the same time. Um, favorite players of all time for you and also favorite ground you ever visited or played at? Yeah, it's interesting. I think uh, if, if I can answer it, Jockey, in this way, is that uh, as, when you grow up as a kid, you have these heroes. And, and I've mentioned them earlier, you know, the, the legendary uh, uh, Um Frick de Pria, Mani Kisru, Paul Bayfel, Jan Ellis, uh, just to name a few. These were brilliant players um, and, and, and left a, a great mark on rugby, not only in our country, but in the world, and impressions on young youngsters out there who wanted to be like them, who wanted to play the game like them. And people that I played with, you know, I've, I've got some great friends uh, which I'm extremely blessed. Uh, guys, like I said, not only that I played with, but against, you know, Ruben Kruger, for instance, who I played mostly against. He played for Northern Transvaal, a brilliant, not only a brilliant player, but an even better human being. Uh, and I can carry on. Henny LaRue, Yapi Mulder, I mean, Bali Swat, we were both bosom buddies from school. We were in the hostel together. Gavin Johnson, um, Jock Willoughby. I mean, I'm just mentioning a few guys. Uh, people even that I didn't play with, but our rugby players before my time, the Divan Safontains, Hempi Zatoy, Bulan Kutsia, just to name a few. These are unbelievable, upstanding human beings, uh, which the game actually showed that they are and more important. Yes, they were great players and they're now great winemakers or businessmen, but more important, in the end, they're better human beings. 
And um, what what would you say is your favorite ground that you ever visited or played at? Well, outside Ellis Park, I'm very biased towards Ellis Park. It's it's probably one of the of the, the most most impressive rugby stadiums in the world. If it's full, the eighty thousand people, fanatical supporters that support the Springboks if they play there is unrivaled. You can talk to uh, Sean Fitzpatrick, to St. St. Brook, David Campisi. These guys also, it's so intimidating to go to Ellis Park when it's packed with fanatical Springbok supporters that it blows into your face when you hit that ground down that tunnel with 80,000 people. I'm getting goosebumps sitting here telling you this, Jockey. It's, it's an incredible feeling. That's that, awesome, that's my man. Local, yes. That's my local, local field. Sorry, but one that I've always wanted to play uh, uh, at is the old card of arms park it, it's uh, the millennium stadium now in, in wales because if there's other people besides us the new zealanders and and uh, a couple of other countries that adore the game of rugby that love the game of rugby and they've got a special atmosphere because they sing along so well as you know the welsh people they they just start singing and that's part of the spirit there the old card of arms because that stadium was like built right onto the field it's in your face uh, and, and and it's extremely intimidating i've always wanted to stand there and listen, funny enough, not only to our anthem, but to their national anthem. And that, that sort of second national anthem, which they call Bread of Heaven. And you'll know this. It's so mm. beautiful. It's unbelievable. And tell me, from a commentator's perspective, favorite ground to commentate at and why? You again mentioned Ellis Park. Loftus, the, the facilities is, 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 is brilliant. It's easy to access. It's, it's, it's the view, as you know, as a commentator, you're involved in this as well with us at Supersport. I mean, it's a great view um, the, uh, and so forth. Uh, uh, I would say the, 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 there's a couple, the new Cape Town Stadium is wonderful because obviously it's more modern technology, modern, uh, better planned and so forth. Unfortunately, it's sad. It's sad that some uh, a stadium like Newlands now is is uh, in its final year, but it's so old. Yes, I'm a big traditionalist jockey. I love tradition, good traditions, but it, it's probably better for the game and for the spectators that, that it's moved to the Cape Town Stadium where it's so much better, bigger, um, uh, and better planned as well from a commentator's point of view. But then overseas, Twickenham is great. You know, um, Auckland is, is, a, is, is a great stadium. Wellington in New Zealand, the Cape Town, as they call it, um, all these mm. new, brand new stadiums are, are better planned and their facilities are really world-class. Yes. Um, Chris, and I want to ask you, um, I've, gone, uh, I've gone through your CV, if they can call it that, your rugby CV. And I mean, you... Don't believe you, a word you've... of that, <laughs> um, Well, let's see. Let's see what is true and what's not. But um, just, just to mention a few things. I mean, you played in four Curry Cup finals of which you won two. Um, five. You, sorry, is that right? Five, no, five. We, I, I was involved, lucky enough to be in five uh, finals. The first one was at Loftus against um, the formidable Nas Butters team, who were really at that stage on fire. Yeah, that's true. Um, you guys were, and a lot of people probably don't know this, and they do know it. And I know a lot of the Lions supporters these days. That's the only claim to fame when it comes to Super Rugby, but you and the team, Super 10 team that of 93, that won, that won, well, let's call it Super Rugby, even though it wasn't Super Rugby then, but it's still part of the family. So, yes, you guys were the first African team to win Super Rugby. Um, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> as a Blue Bull supporter, <laughs> I mean, we've won... We've won it three times, but I mean, an honest guy will always, you know, give credit where credit's due. And I mean, that team that you were in was one amazing team. Um, anybody that that knows the rugby from back then, if you if you just go through the team, it was something of, you know, you don't you don't get those kind of teams these days. Um, the Crusaders maybe come close to it, but I mean, you were very special. Um, you know, well, I mean, it must have been a hell of an honor to be part of that team. It, it was a great team. I say that very humbly. It, it was a, 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 and what made it special, I think, is, is uh, Transvaal, as you remember, just came out of sort of a couple of bad years, you know, sort of uh, not really great performing, changing coaches every second year and so forth. And then the, the likes of Keith Christie was approached and he came in and then he started building this team, um, which started uh, at the end of, of 92. Um, it was a special team. Uh, and also that final, let's go back to that final, um, it was a, a, a it was a great final. It was, it was a test match, literally test match. The Auckland side was a full on, full on All Black side from one to fifteen. 
plus a couple of oaks on the bench. It was an all-black side. Uh, at that stage, only a couple of our guys on the team were, were, were Springboks at that stage, late, and, and most became Springboks later after that. But the fact remains, it was like a test match. It was 80,000 people in this park. It was an unbelievable physical game. And yes, I think uh, that was the start of, 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 of a couple of dream years under the, the leadership of, of, uh, of Kitsch Christie. You know? and, and, and there was there were some great players. I think we had a solid team. We, 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 uh, the likes of Ray Moore, Kitsch Christie, and, 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 and uh, these guys uh, uh, started putting the other side that believed in themselves, um, that trained uh, professionally. Um, that really had goals in mind, and and uh, not only did we win the, the the first super title, but also the Curry Cup, the Lion Cup, the Yardley Cup, all in one year, mm-hmm. uh, which was which up to this date has never been done before. Yeah, that's right. Um, I recently read James Dalton's book that he, he uh, and I remember clearly how he mentioned how Ray Mort, the way he trained you guys, was just on another scale. It was actually way ahead of its time. I mean, conditioning coaching is only something we hear of nowadays. I mean, but he was doing it back then with with the likes of you in the mix. How was that for you? Well, there's only one way you can play sport and that's to be fit. And, and the way Ray is actually brilliant in that regard. Ray was a, was a great player to start off with. So he understands what it takes to be, to be a, a good player. You need to be first fit and then you can start thinking on the field. To make decisions under pressure and so forth. So we were superbly fit. We were in great condition. We, as I said, he trained. I mean, there were some days, Jockey, that that I thought to myself, and I started praying that the dear Lord can come fetch me any time. He'll do me a favor because I, we were dying. He was killing us. Yeah. But it late it later made sense. You know, it later made sense. And in that those last twenty minutes, then you change gears uh, and 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 you go into overdrive, and then you out, outplay the teams, and that's how we beat many teams. Uh, uh, you can have all the skills in the world, you can have all the technique in the world, but you need to be fit, um, especially if it goes down to the wire. How many games have we seen it goes down to the wire, and then the fittest team is the one that makes the right decisions? Yeah, that's true. Um, part of the glory is obviously the big one, 95, World Cup in South Africa, and you are part of the team. Give us a little bit of insight, something that maybe hasn't been mentioned before, because I think we've all heard so many stories, but I think we've all heard the same story always. Maybe there's something you can share with us that nobody knows of, um, you know, in, in regards to that whole, you know, time that you guys spent together. Yeah, Jock, there's thousands of stories I can tell you um, of moments, uh it was just an incredible blessed time. It's a, it's something that we that we worked hard. If I say we worked hard, I mean it's an understatement. We focused towards this. Uh, we geared our minds, uh, our training sessions. This this was a build up of two years uh, towards this very special occasion. And you'll remember we were in, in sport isolation uh, and and really only had about two years to prepare for this, which was really unheard of. Um, and and. Uh, we in the beginning knew it's 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 important, and we and and we we promised ourselves that you know we're not going to sacrifice all this time and effort and blood, sweat, and tears and 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 years of our lives if we if we're not successful. And 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 uh, we committed to each other as a team. It was a, a very a very special um, uh, 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 team. So uh, in this regard, that everybody bought into this, uh, every team member, every uh, coach, uh, every support staff member. We all knew exactly what our plans are, how we're going to do, how we're going to progress. Uh, who we who we knew if we beat, uh, win our pool, we will play probably that team next. So it takes a lot of planning, as any World Cup. Um, but but uh, to play at home in a World Cup, first in a World Cup, playing a World Cup final is a big privilege. That's what every player uh, sacrifices years of his life for. And then to play at home uh, in South Africa, where we know, I mean, to say we have fanatical supporters and understatement, I mean, you know it as well as I do. We know that was a weapon that we had as well. Uh, and as we mm-hmm. progressed in this World Cup, uh, um, stage uh, after stage, we realized, and the support, just the way to start building and building. And, and the support was absolutely incredible by the people of this country. I mean, they, they were such a huge, huge help. Uh, but there were, there were a lot of stumbling blocks, and it wasn't easy. And, and, and again, I mean, I, just to name a few, uh, uh, the, the the battle of the boot, as you know, I mean, what happened there? Yeah. Like two plays. You mentioned you mentioned uh, bully uh, uh, Dalton earlier. Him and Peter Hendricks were, were sent home. They were they were out of the World Cup, so we had to refocus. You know all those kind of things. That game started about two hours late, as you know. There was problems yeah. even load shedding. Load shedding uh, had a new name in that in that, uh, in that uh, game in, in P. Um, 
But if, and that plays tricks on your mind. You know, psychologically, you know what happens when on the game day, you plan yourself, you, you focus and so forth. Then you warm up and you sit down. You warm up and you sit down. So it carries on for two, three hours. So you've got to be mentally tough. Then the game in Durban. I mean, where we, we swam for 80 minutes, not play rugby, as you know. That yeah. also was another another hurdle. And then, you know, you have players. Uh, Juba went into that game with a broken bone in his hand and he played the 80 minutes. Barley Swad packed in the front row with torn cartilage between his ribs. If you know anything about rugby, you'll tell me, but that's insane. But he played. You know, he stuck. He put his body on the line. Juba put his body... That what I'm trying to say to you is that this was this team and, and, and how these guys felt for each other and for the cause and what we were focusing on. So, you know, when we got to the final, it was it was it was such an incredible day against the old traditional enemy at my favorite ground in, in unbelievable sunshine, 85,000 people. Uh, and, you know, this is what what it's all about. This is what you played for. So, you know, the old story, they say when you get to a final and you lose it, it's like kissing your sister. It's a kiss, but nobody wants it. So who the hell cares? I mean, you've got to win them. You've got to beat them. Uh, no point in getting to a final and not winning it. And, and, and very yeah. few people even then gave us a chance and very few people in the press, you know, and, and they said, oh, you know, it's great. We've done so well to be the final. Even if we lose, it's still OK. Not good enough. You don't get yeah. to a final and then lose it. You, you've you got to leave everything out there. And that's what we did. It went extra time even. And thank God and thanks for the support and thanks to every open that side. And management, you know, we, we stuck our guns and, and, and uh, stuck to our guns and rode the wave out all the way to make it all worthwhile. Quentin van Eysten has got a good question here. He wants, to, he wants to know what the change room was like before the 95 World Cup final and the day um, in the build-up to that final. Tell Quinty that it, 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 it was so tense as if he has run out of red wine at home and I know him really well. Oh, that's thing. awesome. I can just imagine. <laughs> no, but it was obviously, I mean, you, you go through all these things and, 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 and Jock, you, you would think that uh, what is the ultimate for any sportsman or woman? A soccer player mm. is playing at FIFA World Cup. I mean, a cricket at the World Cup, a netball at the World Cup, a, athletics, Olympic Games. So you get to a final in either of those sports for that individual or that team. Um, then you get to the door to open it up and walk through, you know, this is the cherry on the cake. This is what it's all about for, for, for what has come before and for the rest of your life in your game in sport. Um, and then your mind starts playing tricks, saying, did we do enough? Um, uh, have we prepared enough? Could we have done anything more, anything different? And so forth. And so forth. Mm. But, but you shouldn't do that because there's nothing more anybody can say. Your coach yourself, uh, you must just go out there and do and keep on doing, lifted a few gears, but keep on doing what brought you there in the first place. Now, there was an incident that not many, I shared it on Twitter today, so hopefully for the people that are watching today, they saw that um, that tweet, um, which Thais Lombard actually found last year sometime, and then he shared it with the world. And until now, I know you've kind of, you know, steered away and you didn't want to say much about it. But I want, to, I want to ask you, please tell us that last moment of the game. There was a scrum and the ball came out and or the, it got knocked on, actually. You wouldn't know that because you were in the heat of the thing, you know, of the moment there. But when you came up, Ian Jones came up and he had a swing at you. And I don't know if it connected or not, but what caused that moment? If you can please share it with us. Jock, there is a knock at the door. At this stage, I have to leave, unfortunately. So uh, I hope you understand. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's 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 part of the game. It's it's. Uh, you remember Johan Leroux um, had an incident in New Zealand with Sean Fitzpatrick, where you know yeah. they didn't. Unfortunately, they didn't feed Johan uh, well enough, so he nibbled at Sean's <laughs> ear. You know, he was a bit hungry in the game, but uh, people saw it differently, unfortunately. And, and Joe was uh, was uh, suspended for a couple of weeks. Uh, and we had this little personal thing between the two of us. Joe is always also playing for the Val, as you know, for the Lions, and, and um, he's a great guy, one of the one of the hard men of rugby, uh, but but good person, uh, and a guy that never cries. He turns, he, he never, you know, he turns the other cheek. He takes it on the chin, but he can also dish it out. And yeah. we we'll leave that at, at that at that uh, you know that day. Uh, I promised Joe that you know if ever there was a chance for payback, you know. One of us, his teammates, will, will oblige. And we'll leave that <laughs> there for, for, for technical and legal reasons. But 
yeah. in that last scrum, in that last scrum, you know, um, we we paid back the dues for Joe, and and uh, and unfortunately, you know, uh, Ian uh, Jonesy was um, a bit frustrated as well because he knew it was all over, and uh, and he, yeah. he got a punch in, and and I don't mind. I took it on. I took it on the chin uh, um, because I knew, you know. Uh, uh, we paid back the favor and, and it was all in good spirit and we, we had a cold one a lemonade afterwards anyway and we're friends to this day so it's no hassle oh that's awesome man that's really awesome so would you say i mean it's obvious we won the cup did we win the fight that day as well did you hear me quibbers no say so again jockey I say, obviously, we won the cup that day. Did, would you say we won the fight as well? I think you're safe to to, to say that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so on another on another on another interesting note, something that I was um, I was just trying to find some other information, and then I stumbled upon. I mean, and it, I think it's a it's it's very well known, the Derwin Jones incident, also in that same year um, when the box played um, Wales. Early on in the game, there was a line-out and, I don't know, something happened. Derwin Jones was knocked out cold. Some people want to say that you were somehow involved. I know that there was apparently a 30-day, you got a 30-day ban. And to crown that, there was even in those days, and I think in those days it was a lot of money, there was a 50,000 rand fine. Um, I'm not sure who carried that. Was it? Did you have to pay that yourself? Did Saru come to the party for you there? Um, tell us about that incident. Yeah, the, again, you know, uh, I'm not proud of that. It, it was in, on the, in the spur of the moment. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, Derwin, um, you know, he hit me with the back of his of his of his hand in the lineup, and I just I just turned around, not even know it was him, and, and let rip, which I shouldn't have done. Um, um, but I just it was just it just happened, uh, and unfortunately, you know, uh, the result was what happened, and uh, I was fine. It was a first. Um, was the first fine of the professional era, you know, you're right, 50,000, which was a hell of a lot of money. Um, and then I think it was a four week suspension. So, uh, yeah, I just, I put my lip, took it on the chin and, and, um, and took my punishment. Just out of interest, how do you, um, do you think the game lacks that a bit in the, in the day and age we are in now? I mean, back in the day, brawls are i'm not going to say fights i mean there were a lot of there were a lot of brawls back in the day i mean where in today's day it's just like no chance it doesn't happen um do you think the game lacks that a little bit i mean obviously not in a bad oh. way yeah yeah no you would be saying and, and, and i mean i would never i would never say that rugby should involve uh, uh, any form of fighting or dishonest play at all but the reality is the other side of the coin it's an intense physical battle um, mm. and, and sometimes tempers play and it happens, and not only rugby, in all kinds of sports. Um, I mean, uh, and not even to talk about violent sports like boxing, mm. it's within the rules to, to try and bash the out to pieces or, or cage fighting, these kind of things. But in all kinds of sports, sometimes you see these kind of things. I'm not, I'm, I'm, and I, and I'm, not, I'm not saying it should be allowed, not at all, but it does yeah. happen. You can't get away from it. Um, uh, I think we must also uh, understand uh, it, it, the safety of the players must always be the priority at all times. But it does happen sometimes. And, 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 and you know, sometimes um, I've seen some humorous moments as well within th those sort of physical moments with out outside the rules and how it's handled by, by referees and so forth and, and to defuse the moments. And, and the, some of the most humorous moments I, I've seen that it, it, it comes out of those kind of situations on the field. And I can tell you a thousand stories um, that, that, that some of the great characters of the game were involved or notorious, uh, you know, for those kind of things. But it's to back to go back to the Derwin Jones thing. I, I, I'm not sure these days which hurt me the most. You know, was the four week ban and the fifty thousand rand fine, or the yeah. fact that one of my teammates, Mr. James Small, helped carry off Derwin Jones from the field, lend and helping out. That hurt the most. Wow, that is an interesting one. Tell me, Chris, um Back to the final again. So, I mean, obviously, the cup was won. The celebrations were going. I heard a story somewhere one day. It's probably a rumor. I don't know. Um, of After you guys had left the stadium, that, and I mean, I still think it's a rumor, but I mean, apparently, the story that I heard was that you went somewhere along the roads of Jan Smuts or something in, in celebrations. I don't know. Is that true at all? 
I mean, just share us some of the after like the stadium and everything, you know, everybody went home. What happened? I mean, just if you can share one or two stories. I know some things are like better left unsaid, but if I mean that's a story I heard. I don't even remember who told me that, but I found that very interesting. Obviously, uh, after we went to to the uh, award ceremony, which was uh, in Midrand, and we we only arrived there at about ten in the evening, wow. um, and that went on that went on for about two three hours. So we got back to Stanford the hotel just after twelve, and I said to Belinda, you know, I said to her actually during the week, um, when we win this cup, I'm not going to sleep. I don't care what anybody does, but I'm not going to sleep. I didn't know what I was going to do, but I was not going to sleep. So back at the hotel. I got a taxi and uh, asked me to drop me off at the top uh, uh, of Jan Smuts Avenue, Rosebank, and I started walking. And I promise you, Jockey, from Rosebank Mall side all the way down to Ravona to the highway, that whole road, there was not one car. It was a snake of people. Thousands and thousands of people blocked the road. They were standing in the main road having a few lemonades. The pubs, the restaurants were all overflowing. So I walked. It took me, say, from one in the morning. I walked back all the way down to Santon uh, and got back to the hotel at about just after six in the morning. Um, uh, it was an incredible experience. I mean, it was amazing to, to walk through and, and sit and play with the people and had a chat and so forth. And when I walked into the hotel, um, there was a couple of other guys, Smalley and Juba, and they were also there and, and um, looked like they just came back from um, from also a similar escapade and a lemonade or two. And, and uh, you know, we, we just uh, carried on with a, with a, with, with a good festive time. So it was, uh, it was great. It was a wonderful experience. Someone else asked me the other day, um, we, we were chatting about mental health and, um, in rugby, which is quite big these days. Something, something that's coming to the fore quite more, more and more. And it, someone actually asked me a question and then, and I thought, I want to get you on the show. And then um, if I do get you, I want to ask you this specifically because you're a World Cup winner at the end of the day. And at some point, everything came, became quiet. You went back home and you closed the door behind you and then all the noise was gone. Can you share how it was for you um, in that moment? Because, I mean, it's not like today's day where guys finish a World Cup, they get on a plane and they have to go play rugby in Japan. There was obviously a few weeks or whatever. I, don't, I can't remember. It's so long ago. I mean, 25-odd years ago. What was it like for you? Getting back home, no friends around, just you on your own. Well, it's 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 a strange uh, it's a strange uh, situation in this way that I mean, you you just won the World Cup. You now the best in what you do uh, in in your trade for that moment or for the next four years, and you're obviously very very um, grateful and 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 it's it's. Sort of pay back for all your hard work, and you and you and you and you enjoy the moment. There's no doubt. But uh, we quickly realized, and I quickly realized that the next day is a new day, and yesterday is in the past. You know, so now you now it becomes more difficult. Now for the next four years, you have to defend that title that you are the best because everybody's gonna gonna go for you. Um, and that's like life, isn't it? If you you know, it's it's tough to get to the top, to climb the ladder, but it's even harder to stay at the top in anything in life. And that's what I think that sort of the main message was from that that uh, it's great you tick the box and, and you're blessed to be part of a handful that can say that but then also uh, it becomes tougher because people want to knock you off that pedestal and um nowadays when when you reminisce about the day the playing days and stuff do you miss it a lot i say this with great respect uh I don't miss the game at all because I've been extremely blessed. Um, I've achieved that I could everything I could ever have dreamt of. I was I was amazingly blessed, and I thank all the people that I played with, against the coaches, the, everybody that had a positive influence. Uh, I will ever be indebted to. I'll be indebted to the game forever. I can never repay what it's given me. But I don't miss the game because because of those reasons. But I do miss the guys. I miss the the the, the guys that I played with and against. I loved going on tour. Uh, because I believe you build character on tour. You see which players you want in your team. Players that are out of the comfort zone, away from home. Those are the mm. ones that you want to uh, choose in your team because they have the the, the right uh, fabric, uh, fabric and they've got the right mentality uh, and drive to be successful. So uh, <coughs> tours were really, really uh, enjoyable. I love touring. Um, and uh, if you ask me again, you know, if, if uh, 
if I have the chance again to, to choose uh, the same sport without any doubt whatsoever, um, there's nothing I'll change. What is your opinion on what is your opinion on um, the way the world has gone with rugby and you don't see those those tours anymore? I mean, do you would you like to see those tours come back? Like the Curry Cup, for instance, would you like to see the old Curry Cup be rejuvenated? I think it's one of the problems in rugby the state is that we're not touring enough. Uh, if I have a suggestion, I would say do uh, rugby championships every second year and the year in between you tour. Six weeks, eight weeks, you tour around the world. Um, uh, and I think everybody should do that because where do you build character, where do you identify young talent as well is away mm -hmm. from home on tours when the, the team live in the same hotel, the same bus, and they together all the time like a family. Then they really get to know each other. Tours are extremely important. I think, unfortunately, money has maybe become too important in this stage, not the ones being paid to the players, but from a sponsorship uh, point of view. And, of course, we need sponsors. Absolutely. I'm not yeah. knocking that. I'm just saying, but not to the detriment of the game. And by us not touring long enough and going on these tours around the world, um, I think it's a mistake, uh, and I think it should be brought back. Um, something when I was doing a bit of research on your career and stuff, I actually discovered something I wasn't aware of at all, and I'm not sure how many other people are aware of it. But there was apparently a time that you played in Italy. Um, how did that come about, and how long was this that you? Who did you play against? I was I was still studying junk and, and obviously um, you know I love touring and I always loved going over, overseas and so forth. So I got the opportunity when I was still studying to play in France and Dion Oosthuizen, a good friend of mine who we we played for Western Transvaal together and then he went to the Bulls and I went to the Lions. Um, we uh, got a, a, a contract to go and play in a, a, um, a East East French Northeast France uh, town of Strasbourg, which is on the German border, which is great. Look, it was another world playing at conditions sometimes at minus 10, minus 15 in snow and so forth. But oh. it was great fun. It was great fun. Loved it. Uh, and then also played later uh, in the south of France in a town called Carcassonne, um, uh, which is near Toulouse. Uh, and the, the one you talk about was in Italy, the one where I played in the north in a town called Padova for the Club Etarca um, with David Knox, the Wallaby Flyer. At that stage, David Campisi was playing at Milan and Nas. With a fat small Tito Lupini, they were playing at the Rovigo, the big rivalry, as you know, like a derby between uh, the uh, Northern Transvaal and the Lions or uh, Western Province and the Bulls. Um, it's the same kind of thing between Rovigo and Petrarca, um, which takes uh, place every year there. So it was a great experience. I love Italy. I love the people in Italy. They're great, hospitable people. Um, and I, I thoroughly enjoyed my time there. I mean, I remember my second game. Um, was against Rovigo at Rovigo and for you know for a small town just to give an idea uh, part of our university city is about uh, 800,000 to a million people uh, compared wow. to Rovigo, Rovigo which is a farmer's community and uh, there can't be more than 50,000 people but they've got this huge rivalry and uh, we played there there was 35,000 people at this club game for this massive derby uh, and uh, for the for the past five years, uh, my team, uh, Petrarca, lost against Rovigo with Nas and them, and there was no chance. But that day, we played at a hunting game, and we beat them. It was absolute chaos uh, around that wow. It was the quickest I've seen 35,000 people get in their cars and go. <laughs> yes, yeah, see. Um... I mean, obviously, rugby, rugby came to an end, and um, I'm assuming that's when Visanov came to the to the front. Um, you know, uh, or you know, you started off Visanov. Um, how how did you get into coffee? Well, I I, I love cooking at home. So uh, uh, I've always had this love. My mom taught me, and, and I've always had an interest in it uh, to cook. Uh, and then, you know, um, when I met Belinda, we, we, we had this great idea of, of starting our own business and, and uh, not sure what. And, and uh, it happened to be, it be put in an offer for a coffee shop without any experience, um, paid too much for it. And we just felt that it had potential. And, and that's where they started, you know, not, not to franchise, but for, for to be self-employed and, and, and work for yourself. So uh, thank God, you know, it went well. We, we, we learned the hard way. Um, um, hit the ground running and, and thank God made 
less mis- uh, you know did more things right than wrong uh, yeah. and learn the hard way as I said which is sometimes you know the right way um, yeah, and and uh, from there you know yeah it grew we're still making a lot of mistakes but uh, we have a passion for the for the for the trade and and uh, enjoying it. Something, um, sorry, I'm jumping a bit back here, but um, there was an interesting stat, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, something that I don't think, um, I hope I'm right, yeah, but I mean, as far as I know, while you were playing under Kids Christie, you were, you got the same record as him, um, with, you didn't ever lose a, a box game, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I actually went and checked. Um, hopefully, this is also right because I mean, one of the things you actually told me was was wrong. But um, you played in total eighteen games for the box, or you had eighteen caps, of which you won fifteen of them. Only lost two and drew one game. That's quite amazing. Yeah, I was. I played a total of thirty-five games, um, and okay. only those two losses. Yeah. So um, obviously, that's a lot of tour games and stuff included there. Mm-hmm. Um, what's your favorite holiday spot? I love the West Coast. Um, grew up on the West Coast of Namibia. So West Coast is. Uh, I love the people of the West Coast. I love the serenity there. Um, uh, yeah, West Coast is, is definitely uh, my favorite spot. And then obviously, you know, Namibia as well. And um, Quinton has got another question. Yeah, he just wants to know who was the naughtiest player you played with. And would you care to share a story that's shareable with us? Now, Quinty, I know he's a lawyer, so I, I can't mention names. I'll be sued. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's, no, there were, I mean, I'll say this tongue in cheek. There, there were some, you know, um, obviously I was I was a very disciplined oak on tour myself. I was in bed by 18 and out by 18, so I can't be part of that claim. But, um, <laughs> yeah, it's always the hookers, you know, the hookers, job. the hookers are a different species, they're from a different planet, uh, we call them aliens, and I played with all of them, all the beauties, you know, Uli Schmidt and uh, Chris Rousseau and James Dalton and Andrew Patterson, just to name a few, Wittes Betendach, uh, a guy called Brut Wa Uber also, you know, he got the nickname, I studied with him in case that he got yes. the nickname, he was in Monument uh, High School, he was in the hostel, so he won a bread eating competition and he got the nickname Brut Wa. <laughs> Wow, okay. And um, just to sort of get to the end of it all, if there's one wish in rugby that you have, what is that wish for you? Besides the Lions winning Super Rugby? Yeah, Jack, I think there's a lot of things. I think um, I think the game has become too... Uh, World Rugby has, has, has made the game too complicated. There's too many rules, too many sub-rules, uh, and we can see this in the interpretation. You gotta, you gotta feel sorry for referees. Yes, if a referee is not a good referee, he's not a good referee. But you, you know, let's let's sort of uh, back them up a bit here. There's so many rules and sub rules. I mean, mm. how the hell can they remember 50 of those? Uh, and and then not even talking about the interpretation of that. You know, and some of those are in grey areas as well. So it must be a nightmare to be a referee. I really feel for the guys. Um, so simplify the game. Cut away many of those unnecessary rules. Make it simple as far as possible, black and white. No gray areas. There will always be gray areas, but minimize those. And make sure that referees interpret. Interpret the law in, this, in the same manner. I mean, uh, because that confuses not only players, it confuses people uh, in the stand and, 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 and people watching the game. So yeah. I think my the main concern is, you know, simplify the rules. Do you think World Rugby can simplify rules because of the safety factor that they tend to use for most of the new, impl- you know, the, the rules that they implement these days? Because most of the it's laws and stuff that get... To, I've lost no, no. the sound there. Okay, let's hold on. Let's see when Kubis can get us back. Can you hear me? Can, yes, we can hear you. Can you hear us? Okay, okay quite. Sorry, man. Um, yeah, yeah. I wanted to ask you, um, do you think the rules are can be simplified, taking into account that most of the laws and stuff that the World Rugby brings in these days or safety or for safety reasons 
I would believe some of them are, but and that's also that's hundred percent. We must always. I said earlier that the safety of players are of the utmost importance. It's the most important. Uh, so they have yeah. to be looked after, and I, and I and I want to believe in my heart that that is the main uh, objective behind all of this. But some of the rules aren't. There are uh, so much confusing rules, um, rules that open up the door for those so-called grey areas, uh, and those uh, in those areas once you simplify it uh, to make it also make it enjoyable. Remember, uh, one of the big things. Why do you think uh, that uh, um, one day cricket and Pro Twenty became so uh, popular? Is because they've compressed the game. It's quick, it's fast, it's entertaining, and it's simpler. Uh, people mm. don't have to sit five days, although I'm a purist. I love five-day cricket because I believe that's where you see the real cricketer that's got the strength, the mental strength, and the, and the, mm. and the skills to outwit and so forth. But there's also room for the one game uh, and the T20 like sevens in rugby. There's room for that. Yeah. There's room for, for those kind of games, and you decide which ones you want to support. If you weren't a lock, what would you, want to, what would you have wanted to be? It's easy, Jockey. Every lock, every lock is really a fly up in a lock's body. <laughs> I don't know why I knew you were going to say that. And um, <laughs> what was your biggest heartbreak moment in rugby? Yeah, um, I think every, I think, I think I would describe it as every injury, every untimely injury that cost you six months or a season out, or you at your top and very fit, and then. You have an injury that uh, sort of cripples you for a couple of months. But I suppose also saying that that's part of the game. That's part of the risk. That's part of the price that you pay that you know beforehand uh, that you, when you get onto the field, that, that is part of the game. And you've got to, you've got to work around that. And lastly, I want to ask you um, on your commentary career, what has been your greatest moment as a commentator? Oh, I, I think... I think uh, learning a new trade, which I really enjoy, and, and hopefully I, I, I contribute in a positive way. Uh, that's what I try at least, and 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 uh, and I and I think to work with with professional people. There are so many professional people uh, people out there uh, on the commentary. Uh, for instance, you know, to work with a legendary Uncle Huey Bladen, with any Quirts and these guys, for instance, just to name a few, are, are, are so professional in their way, and there's so many professional producers out there, you know. Um, Guys like uh, the legendary Silver Fox, Rob Orpen, uh, uh, just to name one of the producers, uh, is somebody that people that can, that, uh, Richard Parker, these guys, uh, that that, uh, that can offer so much and offered so much to people like myself that came in without any training, any experience, and this um, just the passion for it and, and 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 how humble they were to offer uh, help, to offer advice and so forth um, was uh, was amazing. Gubas, yes, I mean, thank you. Thanks for your time. It's been really a great 50-odd minutes to spend with you. Thank you, first of all, for making yourself available and, you know, giving me an opportunity to chat to you like this. It's not always possible. I mean, you know, working with guys like you, it's it's really a, it's a, it's an honor and a privilege, you know, to work with guys like you. And, you know, it's, I mean, for me, who's just a regular supporter of the game and stuff, it's, you know, it's, it's an honor, really. I mean, it's awestruck every time, every Monday, that, you know, that I get to see you guys and stuff. It's awesome, you know. So, um, to spend this time with you has really, really been a privilege for me. And I want to thank you so much. And for those that um, that are on social media, and, uh, you know, Twitter specifically, Quibus is there. And one thing, I, you know, I want to say um, about you specifically is, you know, you get a lot of sportsmen, um, that's on social media, and it's not often that you get to to um, converse with someone on social media. That's been that's a legend like you are. I mean, you're a World Cup winner. It automatically, in my eyes, it makes you a legend of the game. And um, there are a few guys the, these days that stand out. But I think what really gives a, a sportsman a legacy is not what they do on the field, but what they do off the field afterwards even while their career is on. And I think you're a flippin' good example um, of that. And, uh, you know, I really want to take my hat off to the person that you are. And I've spoken to so many people that all, we all sing the same song, um, that you're a very humble human being and, you know, just a great guy to know. And, I mean, for me to be able to say, I know Quibus Visa, I haven't had a bro with you, but um, just a quick little story. I remember the first time I... I, I uttered words to you 
was um, you were having a coffee at Supersport. And I remember seeing a tweet of yours where you have, where you've got this unbelievable bright um, or fire, you know, set up at your place in, on the West Coast. And um, I, I took a lot, it took me, a, it took a lot of courage for me to just approach you and, and just mm -hmm. like, listen, Quibbers, please can you just take two pictures of your bright area? I'd really like to, to make one of those if you don't mind. And I mean, you were so humble and just like, ah, oh, not a problem. And I mean, I was so petrified just to speak to you. And I mean, since that day, it's, I realized, I mean, you know, you're just another human being and a very awesome one at it too. Thank you for your time. I really, really appreciate it. Thanks, Jockey. Thanks for the kind words. Anytime. I mean, uh, the privilege is mine. Thanks for the interview. It was really enjoyable. And yeah, I'll keep up the good work. Uh, I'll keep an eye on this uh, and everybody out there on, on social media. This is a great idea. Um, and I think the, you'll have some many more interesting chats. But thanks again for your, for your kind words. I much appreciate it. No, thank you so much. Please stay safe. And um, like they say at the moment, wash your hands. And yeah, hopefully we'll see you soon again, um, you know, um, face to face and not like this. Thank you so cool. much for your time, Kobe. Okay, Jackie. Keep on, buddy.